have an instruction for this. The kickoff speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm the kickoff speaker for this session, and uh, as all remote sessions are are uh, are a little crazy, um, I can't see my slides, folks. Um, so I'll put them on the other screen and and hope that they're advancing. Um, there they are. Thank you very much. Uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I, I'll apologize in advance because we're teaching a class at 9:30, so our students will be creeping in. I'll try to mute my myself. We have uh, um, several speakers this morning um, from the um, from our team. I I think we have the older slide set. So David Edelman's slides are and name is on here, but he's joining us. So we ha did a project. Um, that crossed uh, disciplines as the FSET program was designed to do. And it's been interesting and valuable. Um, it's a collaborative between the researchers in CCS at the, at the Bureau of Economic Geology, who've been working on this for a couple of decades. Um, we've been, uh, the uh, Wen Song at the uh, Petroleum Engineering has been working on micromodels, David Edelman at the law school and David Spence at the law school, and Leanne Kaler at, uh, in communications. So we've, we've had a good time working together on this topic. Our topic is um, to look at uh, captured CO2 that's captured to uh, mitigate um, climate effects. And we wanted to look at the long-term storage because storage being long-term, that's the value. So. Um, geologic storage and deep saline formations um, must be permanent. Um, it, if we capture the CO2, it can't leak out. Why? Because we're the, um, uh, uh, the, it's not renewed. We put it in one time, we expect it to, and, and we spend money to get it there, we expect it to stay permanently. So if it was leaking 1% per year and kept doing it for 100 years, it would all leak out, which would be unacceptable in terms of climate benefits. So we have to show that permanence is, as we expect, permanent. It, we mean permanent, we mean in geologic timeframes over thousands of years. So um, we're gonna talk about um, three things, the leakage, go back please, uh, leakage risk inventory, uh, I'll, I'll speak about that, then Sahar, Bakshian will come on and talk about mechanisms and, and limits by modeling. And then David will talk about policy and Leanne's work on, on uh, public perception. Next slide. Um, so we're want, in order for this to be a greenhouse gas mitigation, CCS with storage, geologic storage needs to have public confidence. Um, and that public confidence has two elements, that there will be no reversal in storage meaning sometimes this is referred to as a clawback. If you have invested in it, you're going to get paid. Um, that there will be no, uh, that the payment comes from the IRS or the California um, uh, low carbon fuel standard at this point, there may be other mechanisms. But there's a, been a concern by investors that um, the storage would not be permanent and they would not get paid or they would have to reimburse their taxes. Um, uh, so we have to sh show that that will not happen, that the investment is a good investment. The second thing is that the liability is not extreme. People have talked about, well, you know, I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, um, home of the Love Canal, right? And those guys just thought they were um, uh, cleaning the place up when they took their hazardous waste and put it out in the ditch, right? So we wanna make sure that there's no liability, that the liabilities for CCS are normal. Next slide. I have the next slide, please. So uh, I won't do this in detail, the print is small, but one of the things we did in our study is an updated and pragmatic leakage risk, risk assessment. What are the concerns? And what you see on this slide is that most of them are wells. Um, wells, uh, wells are supposed to isolate the subsurface from the surface. All wells are supposed to isolate Every single one of them is supposed to isolate a water well, an oil and gas well, an uh, injection well for anything. Um, 
And most of them do, but there's a, a percentage that we hear about that don't. And so one of the things that's required by regulation is that one demonstrates that there is no, that the wells have all have integrity. There are a few other things up here, of seismic risk. Um, so we've spent a bunch of time and Sahar will talk now about her work on um, uh, modeling to constrain this risk. Next slide for Sahar, I think. All right, uh, thank you very much, Sue. So can you hear me very well? Yes, carry on. Okay, perfect. So for this project, for the geotechnical part of the project, uh, we developed an analytical model to show the plume stabilization uh, during the, the course of the storage in the in the soft surface we also uh, did some experimental uh, you know ex uh, investigation to kind of study the pore scale mechanisms governing the co2 migration and trapping in soft surface reservoirs uh, next slide please uh, so one of the primary risk of CO2 storage is the long-term containment risk, or in other words, you know, the risk of CO2 and brine leakage uh, to the shallow drinking water resources or leakage of CO2 back to the atmosphere. And according uh, to the physics of multiphase flow and experimental measurements and numerical modeling that have been done so far, it has been proved that CO2 plume becomes uh, stabilized uh, in the formation due to the you know, contribution of some, some trapping mechanisms, such as residual trapping, the solution trapping of CO2. And the contribution of these trapping mechanisms ensures that the potential leakage events would not sustain in long-term period. So we believe that you know, incorporating subsurface CO2 retention mechanisms into the risk assessment models is required. Uh, so to respond to this need, uh, we develop a mathematical model uh, driven by the principles of free flow dynamics uh, to quantify a CO2 plume stabilization in the subsurface during the injection and post-injection stage and to kind of address the permanence of uh, CO2 plume in the reservoir. Uh, so this model takes into account the physics of CO2 plume migration uh, when we inject it into a stadium aquifer and its trapping mechanisms during the post-injection stage. Uh, so using the developed model, we were able to predict the time evolution of CO2 plume or uh, time evolution of CO2 plume footprint or extension in the reservoir and the time scale required for complete trapping of CO2 in the reservoir. Uh, so the figure on the right is showing an example of uh, you know, temporal evolution of the percentage of CO2 plume which is mobile in the formation and the percentage of CO2 plume which is trapped in the formation over the course of injection and post-injection. So based on this result, it is clear that you know, the percentage of free CO2 plume decreases over time. Uh, because you know a larger portion of CO2 plume becomes trapped in the pore space over time, and uh, these results are showing that you know the permanence of storage is attainable uh, after we stop the injection, and it can assure that you know we can uh, gain uh, the long-term security for any CO2 storage project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we also explored how geologic parameters such as the geometry of the storage site and fully drug properties such as petrophysical properties, multiphase flow properties affect uh, you know, the model prediction. Um, so using a wide range of geologic and flow properties, uh, we did Monte Carlo simulation to estimate the uncertainty in the maximum footprint of CO2 plume and the time scale required for trapping of CO2. So the tornado charts uh, on the left side uh, show the significance of geologic factors on the model outputs. And the significance of these parameters basically determines uh, you know, which investment in fluid and rock characterization are most important before started, starting any actual injection project. Uh, so the probability distribution of the model output, which, uh, which are shown on the right side, uh, demonstrate that the maximum footprint of CO2 plume is limited uh, because uh, and it is controlled by the geologic and flow properties. And so the question is that why this happens? So as I said, because CO2 becomes trapped in the pore space over time, the maximum extent, the maximum footprint of CO2 plume becomes limited during its storage in uh, stadium aquifers. Next slide, please. So using the analytical modeling, uh, we also quantify the leakage rate through uh, poorly abandoned wells located uh, in the, in the area, area of review or the area of elevated pressure in the CO2 storage site. Uh, 
Um, so basically, wells are considered to be high risk, high risk pathways for CO2 brine leakage from the storage site, and because they have the potential to connect the reservoir to overlying shadow aquifers and to the atmosphere. So based on the uh, a conceptual risk uh, profile that has been proposed for CCS projects, most of the possible issues uh, associated with the storage projects occur during uh, the operational stage, during the injection stage, and the risk of CO2 leakage is expected to decrease when uh, the injection stops and because the contribution of trapping mechanisms become significant. Uh, next slide. Um, so here I have shown one example uh, in which a leaky well is considered to be located in the storage site and it is in hydraulic communication with the underground source of drinking water uh, or USDW. Uh, and this graph on the left uh, shows the brine leakage rate through the leaky well uh, during the course of CO2 injection. And we see that you know, the leakage happens with high rates at the earliest stage of the injection, but it attenuates rapidly after a few years. So it means that the leakage is not sustainable. It declines over time. So it basically it responds to CO2 trapping and CO2 becomes less mobile over time in the formation and its saturation and pressure uh, gets stabilized in the formation, which leads to a decline in, in, the, in the leakage rate. Next slide. So based on the sensitivity analysis that we did uh, using the analytical model that we developed, uh, so uh, we found that the multiphase flow properties such as residual gas saturation is the largest contributor to the uncertainty of the model prediction. And this parameter is basically a poor scale property and it is measurable in a micro model lab setting. So we believe that incorporating the experimental findings into our model can help us narrow down the most likely values of poor scale properties and to better constrain you know, uh, the, model, the model prediction. So to respond to this, Natively, as a part of this FSET project, uh, we did a collaborative work uh, with the petroleum engineering department. Uh, they did microfluidity experiments in fabricated microchips uh, to observe the physics of CO2 brine flow uh, at a core scale. Uh, so uh, in these experiments, uh, the micro model was initially, uh, you know, uh, saturated with brine and having, you know, setting the same condition for an aquifer and uh, CO2 is was injected into the micro model to mimic the storage process. And uh, the displacement of brine and CO2, the fluid flow, uh, the multiphase flow, you know, physics was observed under uh, using the microscopy techniques. And in this slide, what uh, I'm showing here, you can see some of the outputs that we got uh, from the microscopy of the microfluid experiments that we did uh, for this project. So I'm pretty much done uh, with the geotechnical part. So David, uh, over to you. Good morning. So I'm going to be presenting Leanne's work. And since I didn't actually do the work, I'm going to sort of approach it from a pretty high level. Um, this work, as you can see on this slide, is based on um, two papers that Leanne has uh, worked on uh, with a variety of other researchers. Um, so can you go to the next slide, please? So there are really two basic components of this work. Um, the first part of the first component of the work deals with what's referred to as psychological distance. And basically that's, you know, in essence, how imminently um, the risks associated with climate change are felt or perceived. Um, and what Leanne is trying to do here is understand the connection between kind of the perceived imminence of climate change and how that influences receptivity towards or support for carbon capture and sequestration. Um, and the result is maybe a result that would be intuitive. Basically, the more imminent it's felt, um, the more support there is for CCS um, in terms of the perceived benefits, but um, it doesn't seem to have any effect, negative or positive, with regard to the perceived costs associated with CCS. Um, so in a sense, um, the more imminently the risks associated with climate change are perceived to be, um, the greater likelihood there is going to be support, you know, greater support for, car, you know, mitigation methods like um, carbon capture and sequestration. The negative aspect of this is, for the most part, at least um, the folks that were um, uh, surveyed in Texas, 
um, they don't perceive climate change to be um, imminent. Um, and so the expectation is that over time, these perceptions will change as uh, the impacts of climate change become more tangible, but there's going to be a lag associated with this. And so overall, psychological distance is probably working against or at least not helping um, public support for CCS. So that's kind of the first part of the project. Um, if you go to the next slide. So the next slide um, surveyed, again, a group of about 760 people in East Texas. Um, that area was selected because it's an area where uh, we anticipate significant CCS um, or favorable context for CCS development. Um, and so it's intended to be roughly representative of the population that would be most directly impacted by CCS um, uh, deployment and development. Here, what uh, the researchers are trying to do is understand in particular how um, risk perception or support for uh, CCS is influenced both by messaging, but also by kind of the cognitive or emotional processes in, um, in the, the individual survey. And there are basically two models that um, social scientists think about. There's a cognitive model, which is a kind of more math, you know, rational cost benefit assessing, assessment of risks um, associated with something like CCS. And there's more what's referred to as affective model. And an affective model you can think of as a heuristic or kind of an associational, associational or emotional response, which is sort of dictating support or reluctance towards um, CCS. Um, I think there are two really interesting things about this work. Um, the first is that when you message either focusing on the benefits or focusing on the risks, and that was the two ways in which um, they were, uh, the, the surveys were presented to the individuals, either stressing framing risks frame or framing it from a benefits frame. What you find is that is heavily, um, heavily mediated, not by the associational affective side of an individual's brain, but more by the rational side. Um, and that is looking at things with respect to the impacts on perceptions about benefits, as well as associated with risks. The second really interesting result associated with this is that if you look at the relative influence of affect versus a sort of more rational cost-benefit balancing, there's an asymmetry between um, the, uh, con the effect on uh, perceived benefits versus perceived risks. Um, and so where you're looking at either a positive, you know, benefits-oriented presentation of CCS or a risk presentation of CCS, what you find is there's an even balance, roughly speaking, between the perceived benefits and the individual's affect with regard to their support for CCS. Whereas if you're looking at perceived risks versus affect, it's much, much more driven by affect. And so what's the bottom line here? It seems like when individuals are evaluating the benefits associated with, it, with CCS, they're much, much more in their cognitive mind. Um, and that's much more driving things whereas the risks are more affective. Um, and so that's something that we might want to be thinking about both with regard to messaging and with regard to as CCS is being deploying, um, the types of risks or you know, how we want to be attentive to the risks um, associated with CCS deployment. So let me just you know, speak really broadly. I know I think we're, we're pretty close to time here about the key takeaways from a regulatory perspective. Um, Sahar's and Sue's work is, is really, really significant from a regulatory perspective. Um, and there are two key, you know, the, the two key takeaways I, I take, I draw from it are first, the most significant risks are relatively near term. And second, they're relatively speaking, geographically delimited. Um, and so when we're thinking about potential risks, um, we should be focused particularly on the near time and particularly during the operational phase of a sequestration site. A lot of the concern and a lot of the kind of worry about CCS 
is focused on the long-term risks. But what we're seeing in the scientific literature and the work like Sahar and Sue, and Sue are doing is it's really disproportionately on the front end and the risks associated with releases of CO2 are kind of shockingly short term, like really the most significant ones are within the first hundred years um, of the operation of the site, uh, which uh, sounds like a long time, but the way people have been kind of framing this typically is really you know, much, much more tractable. The second is that public support um, is gonna be really sensitive to perceived risks and presumably particularly sensitive to any kind of salient event that is something that they're gonna kind of latch onto and associate with CCS. Um, and so that's something that we particularly want to avoid. Um, and so part of what Sue and Sahar's work does is by delineating the nature of the risks and the timing of the risks um, so well using their models is it gives us a good sense of what the types of risks are most likely to be associated with these types of facilities. Um, and it seems like the most likely one is going to be something like um, basically a release, most likely a brine into groundwater through either an unknown or unknown well that was improperly constructed. Um, again, one of the virtues that you see from the modeling is that it's gonna be over a delimited period of time, but that's probably, that's both the most likely risk and probably the most salient risk that we could think of. Um, and so from a regulatory perspective, there are a lot of different ways that we might approach that. We might say, um, for example, we shouldn't at least initially be citing sequestration sites where they're located under drinking water. The reality, unfortunately, is that's very difficult to do because they're often co-located. They're often in the best areas for sequestration sites. They're often overlying drinking water. So taking a strategy like that is going to be difficult. Similarly, we could sort of say we're going to try and at least avoid or create incentives um, for locating sequestration sites where there are no existing pre-existing wells. Again, if you look geographically at the location of the sequestration sites and oil and gas development, there's a lot of overlap there. And so that would probably be a difficult thing to do. So what has EPA done? Um, in a way, I think it's kind of consistent with the results we're seeing from a technical perspective, as well as the results that sort of display or give us a sense of what is salient for the general public. And that's really focused on monitoring during the operation of the site and doing everything you possibly can to mitigate the potential for the types of releases through existing wells in and around a sequestration site. Um, I think that's a good approach. Um, I think that for skeptics of CCS, I'm not sure it's going to be totally satisfying. Um, and one of the things I would say about the social science work is, um, I think it's really interesting that the general public, in part because it's not very familiar with CCS, in a way is kind of more open-minded towards it. I'm not sure that's true of a lot of people who are really, you know, thinking about energy policy and thinking about the different opportunities for mitigating CO2 emissions. It strikes me that um, within that community, there's actually, uh, AFACT may actually be having a very significant um, uh, impact on the way people view the costs and benefits associated with CCS. So I think it would be interesting to do kind of a social science, some of this social science research, looking at different cohorts of individuals who are maybe a little bit more sophisticated um, or paying more attention to climate change and the different ways to mitigate CO2 emissions. So I think I'll stop there. I don't know, Sue, if you want to um, say something about this final slide, um, but thanks for having the opportunity to discuss the project. Thanks, everybody. I don't have anything 